329. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> might as well make the announcement. I can I can eat up some time. Oh, 330. There we go. Welcome everyone to the uh, Small Grains for Brewing Distilling Virtual Happy Hour once again. This week we're focusing on disease management and our guests, Dr. Martin Chilvers and Tara Watkins are here. And they're gonna talk to us um, mainly about fusarium, but also about other uh, diseases observed in barley mainly. Uh, but they work with wheat and plenty of other crops too. So um, we can talk about all sorts of diseases and, and crop diseases. Uh, we also have Carl Wagner III joining us from C3 Seeds in Niles, Michigan. And he's going to be giving us a perspective from uh, farmer, seedsman, um, agronomist, and crop advisor. So um, a lot of practical experience there as well. So uh, without further ado, welcome everyone and uh, take it away, Marty and Tara. All right. Um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, if you have any questions or comments as we go through this, just sing out. Um, I'd like to just try and keep it pretty informal. Um, just before people got on, I was just sort of showing, showing everyone our current sort of barley field. So this is uh, the plant pathology farm. Uh, we have a pivot out there that uh, was installed uh, winter of last year. Um, and so we use this to, um, to really create conditions that are ideal for disease, right? Uh, there's not much point us setting up a disease management trial and then not getting environmental conditions for disease. Uh, and so we use the pivot in all the wrong ways. Um, it's, the pivot's got um, sprinklers, like overhead sprinklers, um, to get water across corn uh, when we've got that in, in particular trials out there. But then we've also got like drop nozzles as well um, that allow us to kind of create like a mist uh, down across uh, across the barley um, to really help try and promote like uh, you know wet wet conditions during flowering uh, during heading to really promote um, head scab um, so uh, yeah so our barley for for next year is out there you can see a few coyotes out there that's sort of one of our big well not coyotes being a problem but geese and uh, sandhill cranes so uh, we've got to try and keep on top of management of those that's what we have out there as well all right, so let's fire up this PowerPoint slide set. And so, yeah, so Tara is a PhD student as well in uh, plant pathology, um, and she's here with us too. And she was the one really that conducted most of these trials. Um, so we'll go through and um, just discuss like what we were trying to do. Uh, this, this season was our first year really working with barley. We've been working with wheat now. Um, for many years, uh, particularly head scab, but also foliar disease management in wheat. Um, and you know, looking at um, fertility rates, uh, growth regulators, other things in wheat, uh, working with Kurt Steinke as well, um, some various trials that we've got going on. Anyway, so that's sort of been helpful um, in terms of thinking about barley, but it is, barley is a little bit different. Uh, so we've certainly been learning as, as we go. Um, and so I guess in terms of disease management, in, in barley and wheat, we sort of think about two main um, opportunities, I guess, for, for managing disease. Uh, the first would be those foliar diseases, um, you know, when things start to green up and get going. We don't, typically we don't always see a, a significant yield response from those early fungicide applications. Uh, most of the time, it's not until we get to sort of a, a flag leaf growth stage that that tends to be most important, particularly in wheat anyway. Uh, and so that's something we were looking at here in barley as well uh, this season. And then of course, perhaps the most important thing is looking at head scab management. Um, and so what we've really been looking at um, this year and, and into the future here is uh, fungicide timing and then comparing products as well. Um, and so in terms of barley then, um, a little bit different to wheat. In, in terms of wheat, we're looking for those anthers coming out um, to sort of time that fungicide uh, to um, anther emergence, right? To try and protect the flowers from the head scab pathogen. In barley, we don't really see those anthers. So we're looking at essentially full head. Um, and the recommendation now is really probably three to four days beyond full head. And I'd be really interested in if, if anyone's got any comments on that. Um, and what they're seeing. But that, that really seems to be the more important uh, timing. Um, 
again, back to the wheat story, you know, previously we would have told you, you know, five years ago or so that as soon as you see those anthers come out, that's really when we should probably make a fungicide application. But we know now um, from the many trials that have been done that really probably about four days post um, those anthers popping is when we tend to see like the, the sort of optimal um, head scab management, the optimal timing. And so this is what we're looking at in barley as well. And it appears to be somewhat similar in that once we get the full head and then four days beyond that, that's when we tend to see perhaps the greatest reduction in Don mycotoxins. And so that's that's sort of experience from other states that have been doing this work. Um, Tara, do you want to talk about the inoculation procedure here? Sure, Marty. Okay. So um to really try to drive disease in our plots so that we can get the FHB formation. What we do is we actually inoculate our plots with Fusarium gaminiarum. And so if you look here in the picture on the left, um, we actually colonize corn and millet with Fusarium gaminiarum. And all those black dots that you can see on the corn, um, that's parathesia. And those parathesia is what contain the spores that initiate infection for the season. And so um, typically from year to year, um, we do two inoculation time points. We did do two inoculation time points in the field um, this season. Um, we did the first one around FIX 9. So as soon as we started seeing some flag leaves come out, we went out into the field. We literally have five gallon buckets full of this inoculum. And we go out there and we literally just scatter it in the plots. Um, and so what we're hoping for is that pretty soon after we put that inoc inoculum out, that we might get some rain um, to kind of activate those parathesia, basically come back alive and, and shoot those spores out so that we can, we can get some uh, spores landing on the heads and hopefully get some FHB disease. So like I said, we did um, two time points of inoculum out in the field this year. That's what it looks like. Um, and then the picture on the right and the picture in the middle, um, we unfortunately had very little FHB incidents in the field um, location in East Lansing this year. Um, but the FHB that we did see um, characteristically looks like this photo on the right. So you can see that kernel there in the middle um, is, is browned up and you can't really see it in the photo, but it, oftentimes it does begin to have a pinkish hue um, as well. Um, and so for the treatment list that we looked at this year, um, there are a couple of objectives. Um, so one was sort of compare some of these primary products that we, we typically utilize. So Carumba and Prasaro. Um, so putting Prasaro on at two different rates as well. So six and a half ounces compared to an 8.2 ounce um, application rate. Um, treatment number one there too is, is our non-treated check just to see what, what we get in terms of scab or mycotoxin. Um, and we chose Miravis Ace to do a, a timing study. Um, and Syngenta were pretty aggressive. Well, I shouldn't say that. So there was a little bit of discussion about Miravis Ace um, potentially being applied, um, at least again in wheat, uh, prior to flowering and then still having very good protection of head scab. Um, there was, I think there was a couple of trials that sort of supported that. But at the same time, I think we could probably dig up a Prasaro trial or two where we see similar sorts of, of data. Um, and so in general, what we're going to recommend is for you to wait until we have flowering occurring or in barley until we have a head emergence, right, and before we put on these um, head scab management products. We don't want you going too early and, and wasting product. And again, Syngenta, there was a little bit of um, information that maybe you could go early or maybe you can occasionally, but you're much better off to go at the optimal timing to, to really maximize control. Um, and so that's what we're looking at here, uh, especially with the um, treatment six here, Mervis Ace uh, treatment of the, um, at the boot stage uh, prior to head emergence. Um, and then the other thing that we had this year as well is some um, split applications. So coming in with Mervis Ace um, at heading and then following that up uh, four to six days later uh, with Prasaro or Carumba um, to see if we can even further reduce the amount of mycotoxins that accumulate. Um, and a little bit further down here too, treatments 10 and 11, 
um, in terms of the sequence of mirror-based ACE applications, looking at four to six days post um, head emergence or even up to eight to 10 days. We wanted to go either side of that sort of window of control and, and um, just try and identify when that critical period is for applications. Uh, and treatment 12 there is, is a what would be a cheaper um, treatment, split treatment, mirror ACE followed by um, tilt or tebuconazole. That's what we had set up out there. Sarah's got some animations we can then use. Um, so this is what we saw in terms of the yield data. Um, Tara, do you have comments on this? Um, <clears throat> I wish we had some more statistical differences. <laughs> um, so really the only two treatments that we saw significant differences um, looking at uh, bushels per acre yield this year um, was um, the treatment here that has the A designation, which it was um, Miravis ACE applied at that full heading time point, And then the Miravis ACE um, applied at full heading time point, followed by Prostaro at that four to six days post-head. Um, all the other treatments were um, statistically the same as each other. Um, as you can see, just kind of looking at the, uh, the yields here, they were anywhere from roughly 100 to 120 bushels per acre for all of them. So unfortunately, like I said, we just didn't really see the disease pressure this year. And so I think you know, these yields just weren't separating out. It's not that the fungicide did or did not do their job. It's just, we didn't have a whole lot of disease to protect against it for those reasons. And you didn't see a whole lot of foliar disease in this particular trial, right, Tara? No, it was, it's a good year for growing barley, not a great year for doing these fungicide trials. <laughs> And this may also be some, uh, you know, a, a factor, of, and here's the violetta as well. So this also may be um, a component of the foliar resistance to these varieties. Uh, and so typically what we'll do in some of these types of trials is select a variety that's not particularly great in terms of leaf diseases and head scab um, to really help drive home that message to a variety selection. Because um, really, I mean, in terms of managing any, any disease, that's really where we should start like in the best variety that we have available. And then, you know, uh, judicious use of fungicides to help help support that. And again, no, no differences here in Violetta in terms of the yield. Uh, pretty high yields, but we did put the water to it and that's probably why we were seeing such, such high yields. Um, and perhaps the more important um, numbers we're looking for here, particularly this head scab trials, obviously is the amount of vomitoxin or mycotoxin and we don't have those numbers yet. Uh, but samples are, are off, right, uh, for, for screening. And we, we, uh, we're also sending these out for quality analysis too, to look at crude protein as well, and that the other parameters there. Any other comments, Tara? Uh, no, not really on that. Okay. Um, so Brooke shared some data with us, which was, um, Pretty surprising, I'd say. And Brooke, I don't know what comments you might have on this, um, but we were very surprised at the Miravis ACE um, yield responses that you were seeing. Um, so this is your, tw oh, you've got both data sets here, so 2019 and 2020. Um, so really pretty surprising. I think typically we, we probably would expect somewhere in the 10 bushel range um, most years, I guess, to a fungicide, you know, sort of at, at best. But Brooke, you were seeing numbers um, quite a bit above that, which was honestly quite surprising. And I, and I still don't really have a good explanation for that, especially two years running. So it's not some sort of fluke. If you've had that, that happen two years in a row now. Yeah, I, we haven't had time to really investigate in the mechanisms going on here. We've just kind of thrown this in last minute and um, uh, taking pictures at harvest and then <laughs> taking yield and sending in for quality. And the visual difference at harvest is very clear. The treated, especially those treated with Miravis ACE are very bright in color. And so there's obvious um, disease pressure happening, you know, from basically boot or, or flag leaf boot stage on up to harvest. Um, but, but 
we don't know exactly what that is. And I, I guess my hypothesis is that we've been growing barley at KBS for five years now. And maybe uh, we've got some disease pressure that's a little bit more specific to barley that has kind of built up in the area um, and could be infecting. Whereas I guess one question for Marty and Tara is, has, has there been barley in the fields near where your trial was recently at all? And could yeah. that? Yeah. Absolutely, that, that could definitely be a, a pretty significant component of this. So yeah, we haven't had any barley on the farm and, and I doubt, um, I can't recall seeing any barley fields in the, in the sort of you know, close proximity anyway. So there's, there's probably very little uh, pathogen load um, at the moment. <laughs> I think um, probably the, the closest barley being grown might be Okemos, Marty. Okay. Which is some distance away. Probably not close enough to make a difference in our today. Yeah. So how Brooke, are you rotating half a field or what's what's your rotation look like for this? So this we're, we're usually um, now barley, soybeans, you know, and, and two so a two-year rotation in the last mm -hmm. few years. But you know, this field that's highlighted in the picture in the background, um, I in the background of this picture is where the barley was the previous year. So okay. within you know, within an eighth of a mile was the previous year's barley. And I think, I can't remember if it was no-tilled, you know, or not. I'm sure we had stubble that was no-tilled into whatever the next crop was. So, right. near yeah. within the area. Yeah, that, that would definitely help. Absolutely. And, and I expect we'll probably start to build disease pressure as well. Um, depending on our trials as well, we may even inoculate with particular uh, foliar pathogens. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's pretty, that, that may very well be driving things. So we should really take a close look at them um, this season and see what we get on this next season, I should say. See what's, what's going on. What's, what's the 50 to 75%? Is that amount or is that heading? What What's the 50 to yeah. 75 in, on 2020 represent? As percent of heads emerged or percent of her heads fully emerged. So it's a time point okay. when the product was applied. Correct. It wasn't the it wasn't the rate of application. It was a full rate of Miravis Ace at when 50 to 75% of the heads were emerged. Right. When was Prasaro done? It was done at that same time, at that 50 to 75%. Yeah. So a little bit earlier than than what Marty recommended. Um, yeah. So th this brings up a really good talking point, actually. So it really depends what we're going after as well. Uh, and again, sorry, I'll keep jumping back to that wheat sir reference. Uh, but we've seen this with strike rust as well. Uh, when we had an epidemic of that in wheat back in 2016 or 2017 now, um, if we waited until we were at flowering, it was too late. Like the strike rust had come through and, and done its damage to the flag leaf and the rest of the foliage. Um, and so for that particular disease, you know, at that, those years, those applications at flag leaf were critical to um, protecting yield. And so Brooke, you might be seeing the same thing here. Um, you know, you need to be, once you wait until full heading uh, emerge, you're starting to lose some yield uh, potential, um, especially at least this year in terms of that trial. Um, and, and I guess the other, the other really important thing here I'll say as well is that um, Miravis ACE um, has both a, a DMI fungus, like two different modes of action in the chemistry, a DMI chemistry uh, together with an SDHI chemistry. So typically with head scab management, when we talk about Prasaro, Karamba, um, it's all a, a DMI chemistry, just that one mode of action, right? But Syngenta, it's the only company that does have that other type of chemistry, an STHI fungicide. Um, and there's another student in my lab, um, Michaela, who has done some work looking at this um, across Michigan and looking at like a hundred different isolates of fusarium that causes head scab. We find no resistance at this point to that STHI fungicide that's in Miravis Ace. Um, so it's good news, right? It's not that not that we're going out and spraying and then we're going to see resistance develop very quickly. It may develop and that's why we need to do this sort of baseline check of where we're at in terms of 
uh, fungicide resistance in that pathogen. But at the moment, it looks very sensitive to that chemistry and um, should give us good control against that head scab. So that SDHI combined with that DMI may, may also be giving us pretty good uh, foliar disease control, which might be you know, the reason for um, such significant differences here um, compared to your non-treated or, or even the Prosaro. So that's really cool, Brooke. Uh, you, you're planning to do that again this next season? We are, we have blocks planted that we could do a number of different things, so. Okay, we should chat and see if we can line up some, uh, yeah, I know everything's worked, but I wonder if there's some key treatments we could line up, because this is just really cool. Yeah, um, might as well keep investigating it. And and I also want to follow up on what you said. We, and I don't know if Tara's going to show this, but we have not seen Don response to these treatments over the last couple of years, which, you know, points to um, either we even either haven't had Don or the timing is too early, you know, or, or you know, what, whatever's going on there. So good point about what disease are you targeting? Yep. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely critical, right? Um, yeah, it, it's, it's important to know what's out there. And, and I guess I just put a plug in too, like, um, you know, if, if you're producing barley and you happen to see some spots on your barley, it might not be a bad idea to get um, some samples into the, the MSU plant and pest diagnostic clinic. Um, the last thing you want to be doing is spraying a bacterial disease or some sort of insect damage, right, with a fungicide and hoping for some, some management. Um, so I think, I don't know, then between 20 and $50 a sample, I think pretty cheap. Um, and I'd be happy to put the bill for some of that too, because I think it's just so important to know what you're actually trying to control, uh, if, if you have some sort of issue. So keep, keep those guys in mind. Hey, Marty, how, so how big is the window there? You know, that's a going from 50 to 75, 50 to 75 roughly, then up to 100, that's a big difference. What are we talking about, like a time window there roughly to get from 50% to 100% heading? I don't think it's that many days. And Brooke, do you have any comments on that? Are we, are we talking about four days or? Five, five days. Five days was five days. the difference between those two <laughs> timings. And, you know, the, the big difference here is the um, barley doesn't head all at this, you know, individual plants the main tillers tend to head earlier than some of the secondary tillers. And, right. and so uh, really it was a matter of waiting of just a few days. Yeah. I'll speak to that too at our East Lansing location. There was four days between um, those timings for us. And again, what Brooke said, such uneven heading rates between the, the primary tiller and the, the daughter tillers that sometimes it's difficult to decide um, when you're at these time points and, and when you need to spray and a day or two can make a huge difference. The weather conditions could get you pretty easily in that short of a window as well. Right. As far as if you got four days of rain, you're not probably not going to be out there spraying. Yeah. Uh, we do have um, there's some questions too about fusarium risk tools. Uh, and I remember looking at, um, Tara, what, what was our date roughly for heading here this, this last year in, in the Bali? Um, you can look at May 22nd. That's what May 22nd. Um, All right. date that Violetta headed. I'll pull that one up then. So I do certainly remember looking at um, some of these risk maps and, and we sort of climbed in terms of risk uh, pretty quickly with some with some wet weather that was coming through and then it had dropped off again. So this this head scab risk model is driven on temperature and moisture events. Um, and so this is this model was developed for wheats, but it should be completely applicable to barley as well. Uh, whenever we get into that red um, area, that's when we're sort of at, at high risk, right? And yellow is medium risk and, and green is low risk. Um, and if you're always battling with head scab, you know, year after year, and the map's showing low risk, it, it doesn't mean you shouldn't spray, right? It's just another decision tool just to help try and optimize timings or look at the potential risk. Um, so as we moved along, even from the 22nd, that Friday to the Monday, we went from green 
into red. And so I thought we were actually going to be set up for quite a lot of um, heads gap in the barley um, and perhaps less so in the wheat because the, the risk sort of dropped off again over time. But um, I'm going to zoom here. So picking right up and then dropping off again, right, into, into early June and it's starting to drop off again. Anyway, so that, that tool is available. Um, just Google uh, wheat head scab tool um, and you should be able to find that pretty easily. All right, Tara, what were you wanting to talk about here? I just put this in here. Um, it's a slide from Martin Navelkirk just saying that he has these um, management reports available online that can be looked up and you can see his data that he gets from um, some of his fungicide and uh, uh, plant growth regulator trials that he's done from, I think, like 2015 or 16 up through um, 2019. Um, and his region is up in the thumb. Really good for region. So I just wanted to put, them, put those on there to let people know that they are available um, on MSU's website. Cool. What other comments did you have through here in terms of what you were seeing, Tara? I just threw a couple of these photos in um, because I did see a little bit of foliar disease. Like I said, not a whole lot. Um, this was some barley yellow dwarf that we had um, that was kind of a hot spot in one section of our field. Um, and I didn't know a whole lot about barley yellow dwarf. It was very interesting observations that um, the symptoms were much more pronounced on the underside of the leaf. Um, as you can see versus on the upper side. So just some neat photos. And again, um, that is a virus vectored by an insect. So um, spring of fungicide isn't gonna do any good there. Um, also, we saw a little bit of blotches. I think um, uh, the blotches is probably what we saw most of as far as foliar disease is concerned. Uh, that photo there on the um, left, I'm still new enough to this that I have had a hard time distinguishing between the spot blotch and the net blotch. Um, if anybody here on here is pretty familiar with seeing those firsthand, um, I believe what we have here on the left is primarily the uh, net blotch. Net blotch is more common than the spot blotch anyways. Um, those lesions typically um, are dark and necrotic in the center and a little bit more chlorotic um, in the area surrounding that necrotic. Um, uh, tissue. And a lot of times those lesions, um, as they get bigger, they will get um, more linear and parallel with the leaf vein. So that's kind of a um, characteristic um, way to diagnose that you might have that net blotch. Um, and then also the picture on the left is some scald. Um, and we did have a little bit of scald in some of our plots. Um, one of the more characteristic um, uh, symptoms of the scald is that the primary lesion there in the center is it's not obviously not as dark as the blotches it's kind of a brown gray color um, oftentimes surrounded by a yellowing chlorotic region on the outside and then if you look more at the top of that leaf um, what you're going to see is that uh, grayish brown uh, necrotic regions and then the um, kind of perimeter of those lesions are going to get really dark. Um, so you have a, a, a darker ring around the necrotic regions. So that, that's a good way to diagnose scald. That's not all I have for that, Marty. All right. Thanks, Tara. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought I'd just share a couple of slide uh, sets that um, our colleague Andrew Friskett from North Dakota um, had put together. Um, so they're doing similar integrated management barley trials. And we typically discuss these um, at multi-state meetings. Um, and it gives us a lot more power, right? Rather than doing a single trial and getting a particular result, we work together and, and do many trials across uh, many locations. We learn a lot more from each other. Um, so here's a, a trial that he had out there. Um, this is looking at the amount of Don or mycotoxin there that he's trying to control. You see a non-treated check here very high pressure in this particular location, 10 ppm. He's probably also misting and inoculating, which is probably why he was getting such heavy pressure. Um, looking at various fungicides then for, for their management. So Carumba um, at heading, uh, if you can see 
questions there we go Prasaro at full head and Prasaro at four to seven days post head um, so again that's where I was talking about you know the timing can be pretty critical uh, they were seeing that pretty much uh, you know four to seven days post head would seem to result in slightly better um, mycotoxin reduction than at full head and again, that's something that, that we want to contribute data to as well. And that's why we're doing these, these trials. Um, and then of course, yeah, a lot of us have been looking at Miribus ACE because it's such a new product. So we're, we're quite curious about that. So half head compared to full head. And then again, four to seven days post. Um, so as I said, Syngenta was sort of, you know, marketing as, yeah, maybe we could apply this a little bit earlier, which would be great if it works. But in general, I, I think it's safe to say that, you know, you want to put those on at the the best timings, which again is about four to seven days post. And like we've been talking about, if there's variability in the field anyway, you may very well have tillers that are still, you know, at half head. Um, and so if there is any of that um, activity from that fungicide um, at that half head, then great, you know, that will that'll help um, control vomit toxin in the whole field. And uh, corresponding yield data. Um, so again, here we, we See, I guess what would probably be more typical for most trials, probably picking up, you know, um, about 10 bushels at most, typically, um, from those various fungicide applications. Again, I guess in this particular instance, you know, here we're seeing four to seven days post. Now, as we just talked about, it really depends on the disease that you're trying to manage, right? And when that disease is really blowing up. In, in Brooke's case, it looks like he has to have those applications a little bit earlier, potentially. Another uniform trial. Again, here, um, just highlighting those. Um, well, this is actually looking at those split applications and why we're doing that. See if we can even further reduce the amount of, of vomit toxin that's accumulating. So, Miribus Ace followed by Carumba, four to seven days post. Um, I compare that to just the uh, Miribus Ace at, at full head, you know, you're getting additional control with those split applications. Of course, additional costs, and that's going to have to be part of the analysis here, the economics of this and whether that's worth um, or if, if we can pay for that second application. And again, in terms of yield, again, similar sorts of numbers, right? Looking eight, you know, six, eight to 10 bushels greater with some of those applications. Um, and then this year, um, Terra tracked down uh, Flavia that we hope uh, will have, be a lot more susceptible to head scab. Um, again, really just to help drive home that message to, well, a couple of different things, right? Drive home that message of variety selection that's very important for disease management, uh, but then also give us a little bit more data um, in a year that we might not get as much scab um, with a variety that, that is going to be more susceptible um, to just drive more of that data that we need. So that's what we've got. We'd be very happy to take any questions or comments or, or hear from others. So. Awesome. Thank you, Marty and Tara. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I think it'd be really interesting to see how these fungicide applications affect quality, not just yield. I mean, I think that's kind of the uh, hidden magic there, and that'd be interesting to see for sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we had some discussion about that, right? Because I think it was what? 30, 40, 50 bucks a sample or something. You know, like, oh, I'd use, but yeah, we, we ended up putting everything through the quality mill because I agree it's going to be an important piece for sure. Yeah, and Carl, I can share. I haven't published it yet, but we do have quality data back from our trial this year. Granted, you know, Marty and Tara's trial is going to be more rigorous and more treatment options, but there are some interesting parallels. Um, this year plumpness you know was was a factor protein you know there are various differences and and how much that's due to the fungicide versus how much is just a um correspondence to the yield right i i think you could look at it two different ways there so there's a question in the chat uh are marty and tara are you tracking metrics in fungicide application like method of application droplet size yeah that like that's really important um we are using um let me get the name correct here uh i can't remember it, but anyway it's a split fan right so one fan is pointing forward the other's backward for sort of optimal um coverage of that head 
yeah, that's really, really important. Uh, we need to make sure that we switch from the flat fan to that dual nozzle uh, when we switch over to Headscape applications. We have made that mistake before and yeah, it, it'll, it'll hurt. It's really important you get that, that fungicide where you need it on their head. Um, and we're looking to try and um, get a hold of a um, self-propelled sprayer as well. So most of these applications we typically make by hand, you know, they're small plot, um, so it allows us to do it. But we're moving much, much slower than what most of your equipment would be typically moving. So with a self-propelled sprayer, we might be able to try and look at some of that application technology. Um, I know others have looked at this too. Um, it's been, there's actually a little bit of difference in opinion between Ontario and North Dakota, who I think have been the two sort of main groups. Um, I'd have to sort of think about that a little bit more as to who, you know, what the actual line of thoughts were. But uh, yeah, once you start moving at 10 mile an hour or so, it really changes dynamics. So anything you can do to maximize coverage of that head is critical. Um, that's, that's a really important thing. And we're looking for fine to medium droplet size, right? So you want to make sure you switch over from, from your herbicide um, heads. Excellent. Um, so Carl, um, so if you have any key experiences you'd like to share with us um, from your, uh, it's like 2020 now. So what would that be about seven or eight years growing barley in Michigan? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's been at least that. So doesn't, doesn't seem that long. Yeah, you know, I think <laughs> critical thing is timing. Um, I will say, in all those years, I really haven't had too many issues with down levels. I think if you can put the right fungicide on at the right time, you really can take a lot of that uh, risk out. Um, it's something that, uh, to be honest, I do every year. Um, not that you shouldn't be evaluating the um, environmental pressure, but I think just as insurance, it's something you need to do. Um, I'd be interested in looking at more research on, you know, the benefits and barley of putting an earlier application at flag leaf. I mean, obviously there's benefits, especially when you have rust and we do see that out there. Um, I know for me, logistically as a farmer, it seems like you're such in a compressed season and you're doing a lot of other things at the same time that once again, doing these things timely, um, if you're not out there right at flag leave, it feels like you might've missed the boat and you're just gonna, you're just gonna hold on and wait for, you know, that head scab application. So um, one thing I'm interested in, 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 at least in my world is, you know, we're on a lot of coarser soil types. Uh, the barley is not gonna go underneath the pivot necessarily. And so, you know, we've got a lot of, um, like this year we had drought conditions during grain fill. And I'm always curious as to what fungicides can offer. We talk in corn and beans a lot about the plant health benefit and, um, yeah, you know, is there any kind of a, that, does that translate into uh, mitigating drought stress and other things? I don't know. Uh, you know, certainly when we have drought conditions, we're increasing our protein levels. We're getting thinner kernels. You know, those are the, those are the specific quality questions I would have on uh, those fungicide apps. And then, you know, back to the other thing is picking the right variety. Variety is critical. You know, you can pick a, that, that's going to make or break you in a lot of ways. That's why you got to do your research and look at what Brooke's doing and everyone else here on this team that, um, on these variety evaluations and looking at getting those ones that are natural, naturally uh, tolerant or resistant. Um, Rotation is important too. You know, we, you know, here I'm doing corn, soybeans, small grain. Um, that benefits the small grain. And then one thing that I'm passionate about barley and other small grains is just the benefit I know it's going to be given to my corn and soybeans in that rotation. And that's a lot with doing with disease mitigation or, you know, reducing inoculum and getting things um, spread out for those other crops. So, um, and then finally, yeah, you know, you can, you can see the effects when it comes through the seed processing side of it. And when I do custom grain cleaning, um, especially in wheat, you know when there's been a bad uh, head scab year because you'll see a lot more pink kernels, um, it'll show. <laughs> and uh, sometimes we can solve that on the processing end, but that's not really um, viable for most growers. And uh, so, yeah, we got to solve them in the field and do that, so. So um, I have probably the first question, I guess, for you. Everybody seems to think, and it, it shows that winter barley is favorable over spring uh, for a number of reasons, but would you agree with that in like a specific disease context as well? 
I would definitely agree with winter. I certainly in Southern Michigan, I, when I grew spring barley years ago, um, the growers I'd sell it to up North had great luck with spring barley, but not down here, you know, it just doesn't work as far as disease. It's interesting you say that because the only times that I had really, um, the, the times I looked up the disease book to try to figure out and scratch my head was with spring barley. Um, and I'm, 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 I don't even want to say anything because there were things that were going on where I knew I should just send them up to the plant pathology lab to look at because that's when things were weird. You know, it was, is this barley uh, yellow dwarf virus? I don't know. You know, it's just weird things and things that I wasn't really familiar with that we don't really see. You know, head scabs is a big issue down here in rust, and that's about all I ever really see in small grain um, that are really impactful. But um, winter just has a lot of other advantages. Maybe it's not disease. It, it's just, you know, planning time, logistics, and just um, getting a bet. For me, especially on the course of soil types, it's, it's dealing with that drought situation in June. And can you get grain filled a little bit earlier with the, the uh, um, matures a little bit earlier on the winter plant versus spring plant and stuff? Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, I I like the yields of winter barley over spring, and the timing seems to be better too. But that those seem to be the big two that we mm -hmm. that we talk about, and those are those are great for making the case of winter barley over spring for for lower Michigan anyway. But yeah, I was oh. just curious as far as like managing managing diseases and in that aspect of timing. It's hard to see that disease is a no as long as you're timely on both. I don't you know like fusarium head scab you're going to control. I mean. I, I think it all comes down to logistics. It just feels very rushed in spring. You're, if you're doing everything else you're probably doing, which is corn and soybeans and whatever. And you know, you're trying to plant the spring barley early in the spring. And uh, at the same time, you're doing fertilizer and other applications for your other row crops. And then it just kind of, where I think winter just gives you room to breathe a little bit more, winter barley. The other thing, winter barley is protein always seems to be not an issue with winter versus spring. It always seemed harder to manage in spring for me. And and uh, winter was easier to manage quality that way. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I've seen and heard from everyone too. Um, all right, I think we're up to question time. Does anybody have any questions for for really anyone? Anyone on the call? Uh, Carl, you mentioned a couple times rust. Um, so just out of curiosity, you're seeing that rust in the barley, and Brooke, that can go to you too out at KBS. Have you guys seen rust in the barley? Just some, I mean, not a lot. I think this year in particular, I recall seeing some there early in the season and, and you know, it's always this conundrum of, do you, is there enough? And I don't think it was severe in any way, but uh, it's a question of, is it worthwhile going out and making? it's more of a time issue as much as anything getting out there and making that extra application and then find, figuring out that, oh, it's probably been a little late and we're almost to that head scab application that kind of makes me resident to uh, to do it. But Brooke? I've never seen rust to the extent that you would see rust in um, oats, right? Am I thinking that, that correctly? You know, I've had fields of oats that are just orange, mm -hmm. which is, is that the disease you're referring to that you would? Yeah, yeah, we get it. We get different types of rust in the wheat. Yeah. Um, and like I said, like Marty said, this is our first year doing the barley for, so we're still learning a lot about the barley, but um, yeah, it seems like people don't see rust in barley a lot. So if you guys are seeing rust, I'm, I'm just interested in it. It seems to me, it seems to me that in this, the winter barley, the plants look really healthy most years up until about flowering, right? And then that's when we really start to see the deterioration and my ability as a pathologist is very low and so I can't tell you distinctly what we've had and so forth but in the spring barley I've seen you know earlier diseases powdery mildew um, you know starting quite early and then moving on so it just seems like we must escape some of those diseases early on and maybe it's a temperature thing in the winter barley and then and then we start to see them set in the other thing I'll mention too with winter barley is that um, if you work with a custom applicator to put on your fungicide, they typically aren't ready to apply products um, when winter barley needs it because they're used to wheat and the winter barley being a couple weeks ahead of wheat. 
it's a scramble to get somebody. So it, it helps if you are set up to put on the product yourself because of that. And, and the custom applicators are also spraying herbicides on corn and soybeans at that same time. So it's, it's really a busy time of year. That is a challenge because most of them, if they are used to doing wheat, that's that's down that's farther down the road, and so they're not really ready. And, um, and I'll second Brooke that when it comes to many disciplines, plant pathology is not my strong suit. <laughs> so fall on you, Tara and Marty's a little bit uh, hard show to follow. And and I think that's where like in the future when I see things, I need to just take the time along with other growers to send more samples up to you guys to really diagnose what these things are that we're seeing. Um, and like I said, I don't think I've ever seen too many foliar diseases that are severe enough to really warrant action. It's just, you know, you, you look at things, you try to figure out what they are and you just gotta go to you guys more often. Have rusts in your crop next year. At least send us some photos by email or something because sometimes with the rust, you can tell a difference um, by color mm -hmm. um, and shape of what we call the pustules, just how the rust forms on the leaf or the stem. Um, location of where the rust is so yeah if you get rust please send us some photos at least <laughs> well i regret not saying anything earlier this year when i was up in posen um the barley trials and oat trials were in the same field up there and i found a kernel with highlighter orange fungus of some sort but it was on the kernel and it wasn't on um anywhere else on the plant other than that no leaf or no stem but I had never seen rust around here either. I'd seen it a bit out in North Dakota when I attended a field school. So I know that it's a thing and that it's bright orange, or can be bright orange. But um, I put the kernel in my clipboard, like I have a, you know, the kind of sandwichy container clipboard and it unfortunately didn't make the trip back down with me. It's somewhere in my car probably. But. <laughs> Anecdotal and oh, no value, but yeah, it was totally orange. <laughs> I got, a question. I got a question for Marty or Tara, which is, I know there's some organic growers out there that I work with. Is there anything on the fungicide side that would be OMRI? Uh, there would be. I'd have to go and look up what they are exactly. But I mean, really, you know, most of those products are not going to work particularly well, right? Uh, and that's why we don't screen them. If there's a product that's working, we're going to have it in our trials. Um, or, you know, working equivalent to a regular sort of fungicide. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, there will be, there will be some sort of products labeled, maybe some copper products or something, but yeah, I mean, they're just not really going to have that same kick that, that the fungicides do. Um, if, yeah. If you guys are getting questions about that, that's something maybe I should try and put together a fact sheet on or try and dig up a little bit more information on too. Um, and if there's enough volume of that too, we can potentially try and include a couple of those treatments just to look at. Uh, but as I said, I, you know, the, the problem is you just don't expect a significant sort of um, impact of, of those products in terms of management, managing diseases. And like you said, that really then comes back to, you know, really good variety selection and, and good crop rotation, right? And probably not doing what Brooke is doing, <laughs> whatever he's doing. It's, it's, it's kind of cool for us as pathologists, right, to see that high level of disease pressure and those really significant yield bumps. It's, it's just pretty neat. Yeah. Yeah, there was, um, near Lake Odessa, there was a farm multiple years, I think three or four years in a row that were trying to do um, organic two-row spring barley and um, with little to no success. Um, when they did have clean harvest, it was usually down around 20 bushels an acre, uh, which, you know, isn't profitable. You can't, in order to actually break even, I think they would have needed around $15 a bushel for that barley. But they would call me every year and we'd chat about it, but unfortunately it didn't seem very viable for them. Yeah, potentially some of my colleagues might have already screened some of those products as well. But um, yeah, like I said, you know, efficacy be pretty minimal. So that, that's the real trouble with those those types of products. Yeah, we, we very often get calls to look at or, or um, include some of those types of products in, in other trials, you know, for soybean or corn, where there's significant interest. So the question just keeps coming up. So like, okay, we'll do it, right? We'll put the hydrogen peroxide out or whatever. And yeah, there's just, it just, 
it doesn't work in those fuel crop systems. If you're talking about a vegetable system where you can go through and spray every week this hydrogen peroxide, then yeah, maybe, you know, maybe we can sort of sanitize things that way. But when you want a one shot sort of, you know, fix, it doesn't, just doesn't really pan out, mm. yeah, which is a shame. All right, well, uh, if there's no more questions, um, I'd like to wish everybody a happy Halloween and remind everybody that next Tuesday is, uh, or this coming Tuesday is a very special day uh, where we get to go out and make our voice heard and choices known about who we think should be president and judge and senator and all that good stuff. And I'll be working the polls, so I don't think anybody on this call lives near me, but if you do, <laughs> I'll see you at the polling place. Um, again, happy Halloween, everybody. Uh, cheers to uh, a smooth and fair election. Cheers. All right. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. What's, what's next week, Ryan? Oh, yeah. Next week is um, uh, Alternative Uses for Barley with J.K. Kim, who is a muscle scientist. So he's going to talk about using mm -hmm. malted barley and wheat uh, in ruminant feed for muscle quality and for greenhouse gas reduction. And we'll also hear from Tim Boring from uh, MIAA and Larry Judge again from Mitten State Malt, um, who I think was on this call today as well. Um, he's working alongside JK um, as his partner maltster for, um, for that uh, ruminant feed project. Thanks for reminding me, Dean. I always I always forget to actually tell people what's going on next week <laughs> um, and a uh, really interesting topic. So uh, hope to see everybody there. And thanks everybody for being on the call and I'll see you next week. Thanks for the yep. discussion. Thanks, Carl. Yeah. Thanks everybody. All right. Thanks, Ryan. Cheers. See y'all. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Tara. Good job. <laughs>